On September 3, 1903, Michael J. Owens was granted the patent on a machine that made bottles faster and cheaper than by hand. Eighty years later, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers proclaimed it one of the most significant mechanical engineering achievements in world history. The Owens machine changed glassmaking worldwide because it not only made bottles, it also established a company that would drive the glass industry for more than a century. Mike Owens was born in Mason County, West Virginia on January 1st, 1859. His father was a coal miner, but loved tinkering and building things often when he should have been working. As a result, the family struggled to make ends meet. And at the age of 10, Michael Owens went to work in a wheeling glass factory. At the time, glass bottles and containers were blown by hand, one at a time. Although the glass blowers were highly paid craftsmen, the factories employed children to perform many of the steps in the manufacturing process for just pennies per day. Owens began stoking the furnaces, worked his way up to carrying the glass in and out of the ovens, and then to opening the molds that the glass blowers used to shape the bottles. By his 20s, he was an accomplished glass blower and a member of the American Flint Glass Workers Union. Edward Drummond Libby dealt with the union from the other side of the bargaining table. Libby was the president of the New England Glass Company in East Cambridge, Massachusetts, manufacturers of fine cut glass and tableware. In 1888, high fuel costs and an ongoing work stoppage prompted Libby to move his company to Toledo, Ohio. The city provided land for the factory and its workers. Northwest Ohio offered an abundant supply of cheap, natural gas and easy access to rail and shipping lines. A number of Libby's glass workers followed the company to Toledo, but the new factory was mismanaged and many of the employees grew homesick. Some returned to East Cambridge. Others became disgruntled as the company floundered. Libby recruited workers from other glass factories, and Michael J. Owens answered the call. Owens was hired as a glass blower, but within months became Libby's plant superintendent. He immediately fired the entire workforce, hiring back those men he felt were worthy. Under Owens' supervision, Libby Glass was productive again. Two years later, Libby was awarded a contract to make light bulbs for Edison General Electric, and he sent Owens to run the Findlay, Ohio factory. There, he developed a device to automatically open molds for glass blowers. It was the first of many patents awarded to Michael J. Owens that increased productivity while reducing the number of child laborers. Impressed by his inventiveness, Edward Libby partnered with Owens to form the Toledo Glass Company. Libby provided the financial backing, and Owens provided the creative insight to develop a fully automatic bottle-making machine. William Bach, a company machinist, literally transformed Owens' ideas into reality. For five years, they honed their design. Finally, in 1903, they unveiled a machine made up of almost 10,000 parts. They proclaimed it one of the most wonderful and valuable labor-saving machines that has ever been presented to the glass manufacturing interests of the world. It will run continuously, 24 hours if necessary, knows no holidays, is not affected by warm weather, does not depend upon glass workers or boys, and it certainly can never strike. The Owens Bottle Machine Company was created to license the new invention to other glassmakers, and the company built trial factories to demonstrate the benefits of using Owens machines, but there was little initial interest. They decided to place a greater emphasis on bottle production and changed their name to the Owens Bottle Company. 
By 1920, they had built or purchased 15 other glass factories and were selling bottles all over the country. Michael Owens also kept abreast of other developments in the glass industry. He convinced Libby to purchase a failed patent for manufacturing long, continuous ribbons of flat glass. Owens modified the process successfully, and the Libby Owens Sheet Glass Company was founded to produce glass for buildings and automobiles. In 1930, it merged with the Edward Ford Glass Company to create Libby Owens Ford. Newer versions of the Owens bottle making machine were created and licensed to produce containers faster and more effectively, and glass factories all over the world began automating. Michael J. Owens was a wealthy man, and although he began working in a glass factory at the age of 10, his revolutionary invention saved countless young lives from such hardship. William Elliott Smith founded a glass company in Alton, Illinois, just after the Civil War. But after several failed attempts, he was bankrupt. In 1873, he approached Edward Levis Sr., a local furniture maker, about a partnership. Levis agreed under the condition that his seven sons would be guaranteed positions in the new Illinois Glass Company. The family business thrived, and the Levis brothers eventually became the leaders of the company. They installed their first Owens machine in 1910, and after seeing it in action, replaced all of their glass blowers with Owens bottle machines. Profits soared, and the company expanded operations across the country, buying up smaller companies and investing in others. By the end of 1917, Illinois Glass operated one factory in Indiana, two in New Jersey, and five others in Illinois, including the main plant in Alton, which was billed as the largest glass factory in the world. While the glass industry as a whole suffered during World War I, Illinois Glass compensated by supplying the U.S. military with glass medicine bottles. But in 1919, passage of the 18th Amendment banned the sale and manufacture of beer, wine, and liquor. The movement, designed to cure America's ailing morals, threatened to cripple the glass industry. But a new generation was ready to take over the family business and lead it into the future. William Levis grew up visiting glass plants with his father, Charles, who oversaw manufacturing for Illinois glass. William attended the University of Illinois and then served in the U.S. Army during World War I, earning the Distinguished Service Cross for gallantry in action. Levis returned to Alton, ready to lead Illinois Glass, but his uncles were hesitant. They wanted him to run the company, but only under their continued supervision. Their nephew refused, saying he would only take the job if he had complete control. The Levis brothers relented, and William Levis was named president and general manager of Illinois Glass. By 1923, Illinois Glass employed 5,000 people and produced almost 3 million bottles per day. But the large company was poorly organized. Levis, in his early 30s, wanted to change that. But rather than fight with existing managers and supervisors, he quickly surrounded himself with other young executives open to new ideas. Harold Beschenstein and Randy Bernard became two of his most trusted lieutenants. William's 25-year-old cousin, J. Preston Levis, was named manager of an Indiana plant that employed 2,000 workers. The emphasis on youth filtered down into every department and factory until most of the leadership of Illinois Glass was under 30 years old. In 1928, the Owens Bottle Company remained the industry leader, but Illinois Glass Stabled with young, aggressive managers was gaining rapidly in many competitive markets. Owens president, William Beauchart, approached Levis about purchasing Illinois glass. But Levis wanted a consolidation rather than a purchase and demanded 15 million in preferred stock. When Beauchart refused, Levis raised the price. 
Negotiations continued until 1929, when the Owens Bottle Company agreed to purchase the assets of the Illinois Glass Company for $19.5 million, and the two rival firms united to form the Owens Illinois Glass Company. Beauchart was named company president, with William Levis serving as executive vice president and general manager. But Owens, Illinois struggled from the start. The lingering effects of prohibition and the beginning of the Great Depression forced the company to close plants and lay off workers. And William Beauchart's conservative management style conflicted with the aggressive tactics of Levis and his team from Illinois Glass. Within a year, Beauchart resigned and William Levis became president of Owens, Illinois. With glass industry sales plummeting, Owens, Illinois spent $340,000 on research and development. The company began experimenting with new materials, like glass fibers and glass block, which were introduced to the public at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. There, visitors received a glimpse of the future of glass and its expanding role in their daily lives. Developing OI technology promised to take glass from the kitchen to outer space. Owens, Illinois engineers developed a new method of labeling and decorating glass called applied color lettering. The process fused ceramic colors onto the surface of a bottle to form a permanent product logo or decorative panel and offered customers new labeling possibilities. OI expanded its product line and opened Western markets in 1931 when it purchased the Illinois Pacific Coast Company as well as two glass milk bottle production companies. But William Levis's real vision soon became evident. The noble experiment, known as Prohibition, was failing. Anticipating its repeal, Levis and his executives began negotiating with beer, wine, and liquor manufacturers. OI even cooperated with the U.S. government on new bottling regulations. As a result, they were ideally positioned when the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933. Corporate earnings tripled. From its inception, Owens, Illinois was committed to using some of those profits to improve the lives and communities of its workers. OI plant managers not only controlled the jobs of thousands of area employees, they also possessed the ability to fund area programs and projects and were encouraged by corporate leaders to support community organizations and causes. Owens, Illinois also established Owenized clubs for employees to promote social interaction, recreation, and education. Owenizers formed bowling teams and bridge clubs, but also donated time and money to local charities, welfare agencies, and various causes. In 1935, Libby Glass was purchased by the very company it helped Michael J. Owens establish 30 years earlier. Libby Glass became a division of Owens, Illinois, and continued making tableware. Net earnings topped $10 million as the company branched into production of metal containers, corrugated paper products for packing and shipping, and partnered with Corning Glass in the development of glass fibers. Both companies agreed to share research and development rights, and later established the Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation. When OI Vice President and General Manager Harold Beschenstein left to run the new company, J. Preston Levis was named his successor. He became president of Owens, Illinois in 1941. But the rapid consolidation of glass companies caught the attention of federal antitrust investigators. Beginning in late 1938, the government conducted public hearings on the use and control of patents in the glass industry. William Levis and other leaders were summoned to testify and the company's books and records were subpoenaed as part of the investigation. Owens, Illinois was one of 12 glass firms named in an antitrust suit filed by the government. The suit was resolved following a 1945 U.S. Supreme Court decision prohibiting unfair licensing practices and ownership of interests in the other defendant companies. When America was plunged into World War II, Owens, Illinois converted production lines to manufacture food, water, and medicine containers, as well as munitions and other supplies for the military. 
As wartime restrictions limited the use of metal, duraglass containers were introduced as a safe, strong alternative to cans. Everything from fruits and vegetables to coffee was vacuum packed in glass jars and container sales actually increased. Owens, Illinois also designed one-way, non-returnable duraglass beer bottles for the Army and Navy, who recognized the morale-building qualities of American-made beer. After the war, the bottles went into regular production. These one-way bottles may be handled efficiently and economically to satisfy the thirst of discriminating customers. Customers who may enjoy their beer in one-way bottles, as the boys overseas did and forget the bottles afterward. No deposit, no return. A corporate film division helped maintain morale and allowed management to introduce new policies and programs across the country. The sudden change from fighting man to civilian can be a difficult transition. Our attitudes must not make that transition more difficult. Speaking for all of Owens, Illinois, Preston Levis voices the challenge. Our people as a whole are approaching this program with a firm determination to make it succeed. We know our company is only a small part of this national readjustment program, but every cog in the wheel is vitally important. You managers, foremen, Supervisors and other ownizers are the power behind that wheel. Together we must give these men the full measure of the time, the faith, the understanding and patience they deserve. Today, tomorrow, next year, and as long as the need exists. We're pledged to do it, we can do it, and we will do it. OI's returning veterans went back to work after the war. But when metal rationing was lifted, consumer use of glass containers dropped. Company profits were maintained by post-war construction and the sale of building materials, featuring concepts developed by OI in the late 30s. The use of glass block practically created a new architectural style. And fiberglass insulation and filters went into new homes across the country. In 1950, William Levis retired as chairman of the board of Owens, Illinois. J. Preston Levis was named to succeed him, and Carl McGowan became president of the company. Together, they led OI through a decade of growth and expansion around the world, acquiring glassworks in Europe, Mexico, South America, and Cuba. Owens, Illinois acquired scientific equipment manufacturer Kimball Glass and began production of television picture tubes. OI opened the Westwood Research Facility to develop new technologies, as well as the Duraglass Center, a state-of-the-art testing and research laboratory to improve glass container durability and make packaging techniques safer and more profitable. People here in the Duraglass Center are looking for trouble rather hints of trouble, which might inconvenience customers at one time or another. It's their aim to prevent all possible package difficulties before they can actually occur. So you see, it's no one thing, but a combination of fine manufacturing facilities, fine people, never-ending interest in controlled uniform quality, continuous search for improved methods of manufacture, and particular concern for the efficiency and economy of our containers in use. It's the combination of all these things that is represented by the names Owens, Illinois, and Duraglass. At the request of one of its largest customers, Owens, Illinois turned its research efforts toward developing plastic containers. Grocery store owners wanted Clorox to change the packaging of its bleach bottles from glass to plastic. Spilled bleach was bad for business. And when West Coast supermarkets threatened to ban the sale of Clorox bottles, Owens, Illinois went to work on developing a new container. OI engineers designed machines to manufacture semi-rigid blown plastic containers. 
and in the process, created a new product line. Plastics became the newest and fastest growing segment of Owens, Illinois, and construction began on new production facilities. Raymond Mulford became president of OI in 1961. Mulford was committed to diversifying the company's products with a strong emphasis on research and development. That effort paid off in the 60s. OI technology helped further space exploration by producing large optical reflectors made of low expansion materials for observatories at the universities of Michigan, Toledo, and Chicago, as well as installations in Chile, Australia, and France. OI's Fecker Systems Division developed tracking and guidance test equipment used by NASA. And on July 16, 1969, millions of television viewers watched the launch of Apollo 11 through optics made by Owens, Illinois. The company built Levis Park, a 400-acre research and development park in Perrysburg, Ohio, named for J. Preston Levis in honor of his commitment to technology. OI spent $36.3 million on research, development, and engineering in 1968. Resulting discoveries included solar energy systems, plasma panels, and the design and manufacture of child-resistant closures for prescription bottles. J. Preston Levis retired in 1968, and Ray Mulford was promoted to chairman of the board of Owens, Illinois. Ed Dodd was named the company's new president. Dodd was the protege of William Levis and an ambitious, hard-working perfectionist. When Ray Mulford died in 1973, Dodd was named both chairman of the board and president of Owens, Illinois. Dodd faced numerous challenges, a struggling glass container market, as well as growing public concerns about pollution. It happens in the best of places, in the best of families. Daddy, you forgot. Every litter bit hurts. Right, Susan Spotless. Every litter bit, thoughtlessly dropped, blemishes a bit of America. Please, please, don't be a litter bug, cause every litter bit hurts. OI was an early pioneer in environmental efforts. In 1953, the company helped establish Keep America Beautiful, a nonprofit anti litter organization primarily supported by contributions from glass bottle and metal can manufacturers. But a new public awareness campaign began in the late 60s to educate consumers on the importance of safeguarding the environment. The resulting campaign generated a series of memorable and very powerful public service announcements that helped reduce litter across the country. Some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. Owens, Illinois also conducted the nation's first public glass recycling program at its plant in Bridgeton, New Jersey. The project quickly spread to all the company's glass container factories, and by 1970, OI recycled 13 million pounds of glass containers. By the end of the decade, Owens, Illinois had outgrown its corporate offices in Toledo, Ohio. And on May 22, 1979, the company broke ground on a new $94.6 million world headquarters building. The glass and case structure was the largest, tallest, and most expensive in Toledo history and reasserted OI's prominent position in the glass city's skyline. In the 80s, the company expanded efforts into developing new soft drink containers, first with foam insulated glass bottles and then with plastic. And that's because I think it just... Sportscaster Chris Schenkel appeared in a series of television commercials designed to promote the benefits of Owens, Illinois glass bottles. Why a bottle? I think it's a matter of taste. Pure sparkling glass seems to let all the natural flavor come to you cold and refreshing. Get the good taste of beer. It comes in a bottle. Owens, Illinois moved into new fields to spur profits and growth including financial services and health care. Robert J. Lanigan succeeded Dodd as president in 1982. 
When Dodd retired two years later, Lanigan was elevated to chairman of the board and chief executive officer of Owens, Illinois, and Joseph Lemire was named president and chief operating officer. OI's large holdings and undervalued stock price began to attract the attention of Wall Street. Although a takeover attempt failed in 1982, five years later, a New York investment firm, Kohlberg, Kravis, Robertson Company, purchased Owens, Illinois through a leveraged buyout for $3.66 billion. The KKR takeover saddled the company with debt, and OI began a cost restructuring program and sold off some of its divisions. Then in 1988, Owens, Illinois acquired Brockway Glass, America's third largest glass container manufacturer. The merger gave OI 40% of the glass container segment of the rigid packaging market. The reshaping of OI continued as Joe Lemire took over as chairman of the board in 1991. OI's Healthcare and Retirement Corporation was spun off as a publicly traded company and Libby Glass followed two years later. Over the years, competition and consolidation have reduced the number of industry competitors. Through its acquisitions and sell-offs, Owens, Illinois re-established its primary focus as a manufacturer of glass packaging and plastic containers and closures. In 2003, Owens, Illinois was the second largest container manufacturer in Europe and the overall leader in North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and China. Today, approximately one of every two glass containers made worldwide is manufactured by Owens, Illinois, its affiliates, or one of its licensees. Continuing its commitment to global ecology, OI recently developed SureShot and SureShield technology utilizing recycled plastics layered between new materials to create a method of product packaging that benefits both the consumer and the environment. What began with the invention of Michael J. Owen's bottle machine led to innovation across the glass industry and around the world. The leadership of the Levis family helped create a dominant company that grew up with our nation. Reshaped and tempered like glass from the furnace during the 80s, Owens, Illinois has emerged as a global corporation with an eye on the future and a proud history. <laughs>